Dan Cloud. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And this is William Liu, and uh, I'm the chair of Attribute EBTS uh, New Zealand North chapter. And today is my great pleasure to uh, invite, uh, you know, Professor uh, Limekski, uh, Wilinski, sorry, <laughs> you know, it's my English, also is an issue, uh, to offer us a talk about this uh, uh, connect vehicles. Uh, I hope you guys already read the bio of uh, Professor. So I hope it's, uh, I just have a quick uh, introduction here. Uh, Dr. Wilinski is an international recognized expert in various communications and cognitive video, 5G, connected vehicles, and software defined radios, and also dynamic spectra assess, uh, vehicle technologies, and various systems optimization and adaption, adaptation, and also the cyber physical systems. And he is a full professor of electrical and computer engineering, and a full professor of robotics engineering at the Worcester uh, Polytech uh, Institute, uh, US, as well as the director of the various innovation laboratory. And Dr. Winiski is very active in the technology community. So probably most of you know, uh, he is our previous uh, president of VTS. So it's uh, a really, uh, really thankful, you know, and he can offer us these uh, talks. Uh, I, I don't want to be, become the master of today. So basically, I like to pass my time to Professor Wilinski, uh, 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 <laughs> sorry, uh, to offer us the talk. And uh, I got a little bit of thing, I, I tried to sort it out. So after that, I, I hope uh, uh, Dr. Jingma Julia can help me to chair the discussions, okay? Yep, so time I pass to you, uh, Alex, yeah. Thank you, William. Um, yep. And uh, thank you all uh, from all time zones and all parts of the world for, for attending this. And I'm really honored to be here. And again, thanks to William uh, for, for his kind invitation. Um, like we've been exchanging emails uh, and I'm, I'm really, really happy that we were able to make this work uh, in terms of having a, you know, a talk on some of the work that I've been doing here at the at WPI, uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts in the United States. Uh, so I'm gonna turn off my, my, my video so we can concern some bandwidth. Um, so uh, in terms of um, what I do and stuff, and so first of all, uh, my name's Alex Wiglinski, so please feel free to call me Alex. Um, so I'm a professor uh, here at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and I also lead a research group called the Wireless Innovation Laboratory. Um, in this invited talk, um, I will be presenting my research in the area of connectivity uh, in uh, vehicles uh, between each other with roadside infrastructure and uh, various types of ways of facilitating connectivity and robust, resilient, um, uh, ways in these very challenging environments. So beamforming, most of you have probably heard of this term. It's a sort of the uh, technique of, of, of uh, projecting energy, uh, project, projecting signal energy in specific directions and not in others in order to um, maximize signal noise ratio and minimize interference from, um, and also increasing capacity and a number of other benefits, but bumblebees. Um, how the heck do bumblebees factor into connected vehicles? Well, in this talk, I'm going to be sort of giving a perspective on the work that I'm doing that actually combines both of these two worlds together, okay, under the umbrella of connected vehicles. Okay. So first of all, before I continue, I want to acknowledge several uh, sponsors of this research. Okay, this, is, this research actually has been conducted since 2009. So I've been working in connected vehicle research since I've started my, my, my academic life after my PhD studies. Uh, but in particular, things really picked up in 2009 when Toyota Info Technology Center USA uh, started sponsoring me to do some work uh, with respect to connected vehicles and especially connected vehicles in environments when there are none, there's not enough spectral bandwidth to accommodate 
all wireless communications between vehicles. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that later in this presentation. Um, I would also like to um, acknowledge the generous support from the US National Science Foundation uh, through several grants, uh, which has helped facilitate a lot of this work, especially 1547291, which has uh, been sort of the prime funding source for the Bumblebee vehicle, connected vehicle research. Uh, lastly, if you use MATLAB, you'll know that the company MathWorks is behind the implementation and distribution of that software. Uh, and they've been very generous sponsors of this research over the past several years as well. So uh, the presentation, I'll first describe a little bit about what my research lab does. Um, you know, what, what is YLab? What's a wireless innovation lab? I'll then uh, do a little bit of motivation. Why do we care about vehicles talking with each other? Why, why do we care about uh, connected vehicles? Why, what is such a big deal about them? And then I'm gonna be talking about um, the big concern, which is, okay, so suppose that vehicles are, should be connected uh, for whatever reason, right? Do we have enough spectral bandwidth in order to support all the vehicles we want to be connected on the roads. And then talk about this concept called Vehicle Dynamic Spectrum Access, or VDSA. I'll then go into the concept of the bumblebee. And very specifically, there's one behavior of the bumblebee that we'll be leveraging in order to support connected vehicles, which is ca called bumblebee foraging. Just like you would forage for food or deer or other animals would forage for whatever they need in order to survive. Bumblebees also forage. They, they forage for nectar from flowers. Well, that behavior can be very useful if you're trying to now forage for wireless spectrum to communicate across. I'll then talk about vehicle beam forming. And then finally, focus on a use case, which is called vehicular platooning. Okay, so first my lab. So this is a little bit of a pixelated picture, but I wanted to make sure again that bandwidth wise, this would actually communicate over the air. Um, so the Wireless Innovation Lab is about people. Um, we're all very interested in all aspects of wireless communications. Um, and in particular, we not only do in my research lab, um, we not only do fundamental research, but we also look at how do we do applied research? How do we bridge the gap between the theoretical concepts and sort of the practical applications? So we're both fundamental researchers and experimentalists. So it's really a team effort amongst us all. So at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, at WPI, my lab, you know, we're really close, we're really active, we're really keen on looking at solving problems, both theoretical and applied, in wireless communications. So our mission, uh, we, what we try and do is we try and educate and mentor the next generation of leaders and innovators in wireless. We try and do fundamental and applied research um, and build proof of concepts. And we also try and find solutions to technically challenging problems that are re relevant to today. And we do quite a few things, but our core competencies are in 5G communications and networking, satellite and space communications, machine learning and cognitive radio, Connected and autonomous vehicles. So this presentation's a lot on the connected and autonomous vehicle side and software-defined radio prototyping. Um, as for myself, I think I mentioned this enough. Uh, I'm a professor in electrical engineering robotics. I have eight PhD students and four master's students. Um, uh, William was very kind to mention that I was uh, the past president of the IEEE Vehicular Technology Society. And I'm also involved in several other activities um, both um, a regional and national. And I've published about 50 journal papers, 95 conference papers, nine book chapters, and three books, including the one you see here, uh, which is actually free. You can download this uh, free electronically, and it teaches you how to do digital communications using software-defined radio. Okay, so like on to the fun stuff. So connectivity, vehicular connectivity. So, um, if any of you like, you know, read Wired um, or any other sort of like, you know, sort of high tech journal or magazine or YouTube channel and such, uh, or watch the news, you always hear about self-driving cars. You hear about how wonderful they are, how we're like, you know, after uh, like over the last several years, 
uh, what seemed to have been science fiction, which actually self-driving car technology has been explored for about 70 or 80 years. It's actually been decades that self-driving cars have been explored. But the last four to five years, we're beginning to see self-driving cars becoming a viable road vehicle that we can see on highways and streets in the next couple of years. So like for instance, one of the main prime movers, if you will, of self-driving car technology is Google. As we see here, this little cute little vehicle has a LiDAR on top, you know, this little black thing, and, and which is really neat. Uh, probably has radar and vision systems and it drives on its own. This is probably done in Silicon Valley in California. And, and everyone talks about how wonderful, how this technology is evolving, and there's like a lot of advancement and it's all great, right? And the main, one of the main reasons behind why self-driving car technology is taking off. So one, obviously, is the computing technology is at such a level that it can process all the situational awareness information around that vehicle to quickly make decisions on how the car should act and behave. Now, I mentioned something really important in that sentence I just mentioned, which is situational awareness. So situational awareness is sensing technology. It's gathering information around the vehicle. Where am I? Who's around me? What are the conditions? And what should I look out for? And then that gets fed into an algorithm, could be AI, artificial intelligence, or machine learning, to process that situational awareness information to then say, ah, I need to do X, Y, Z in order to drive safely. Now, um, what we see here is like a number of modalities in terms of how a vehicle senses around it. Everything from like the blind spot detection, which is already available in a lot of uh, 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 cars and trucks and such. Parking assist, like, you know, cars who can park themselves. Um, adaptive cruise control. Uh, and this is all facilitated by technology such as LIDAR, long range radar cameras, ultrasonic sensors and the like. So this is an image, okay, of what LIDAR sees around a vehicle, right? So that funny little thing that I pointed out a couple of, like this little black thing here, uh, most likely if, if like, uh, you know, it's like one of those 70 or $80,000 US uh, LIDAR units, it produces this, this thing called a point cloud, which is essentially the LIDAR emits a laser around the vicinity and then the reflections come back to the LIDAR unit and based on like, you know, the, the duration of how far it, it, uh, it's taken that laser beam to hit and then reflect back, you can actually dis, dis, discern where's the walls, where's the light posts, where are the people, everything around that vehicle, which is great. Okay, fantastic. That's great sensing technology. And why do we do, why do we do self-driving? Again, like, you know, other than the fact that it looks cool, right? And there's a lot of like really interesting conveniences around it. Like suppose you have a disability, suppose you can't see, um, or you, you are impaired somehow in your ability to drive a regular vehicle, self-driving car, self-driving cars give you the ability to get back on the road, give you that great mobility to go from point A to point B right? But the prime mover, what a lot of people have been looking at self-driving car technology for, is the fact that it takes human error out of the equation when it comes to car accidents and to car fatalities. So the idea is, when you look at these curves, okay, um, what we're looking at in particular is this thing here on the right side, the total depths, right? Um, and what we're looking at, okay, over the years, right, is this thing of, of like, you know, deaths per billion, like uh, th this data is uh, like, uh, like it talks about like, you know, just in the United States alone. Uh, what it shows is that we approximately have about 35 to 40,000 deaths per year on American roads. Uh, and, and a lot of those are due to human error, right? So what happens if instead, Instead of human error, where somebody made a bad judgment call and says, I'm going to run that red light because I think I can make it. I think I can make it. And then suddenly gets into a car accident and people die. Self-driving car will stick by the rules of the road. It will have really good situational awareness. 
and he'll take that sort of those poor judgment calls at those rare instances out of the equation and potentially reduce the total deaths in the United States by uh, due to vehicle collisions and such. So there's an issue though with these sensors that like everybody's been hyper focused on. Like so, I'm building up to the big punchline here. So fo folks, bear with me. There's a reason. There is a like I'm looking at this over the past several years. I'm looking at the self-driving car platforms. And everybody talks about how great the LiDAR is, um, which is this little, this is a tiny little cheap version, okay, to the, the right image here. Uh, people talk about radar. Uh, this is actually my hand. I'm actually holding a demo version of an automo automotive radar that you would have like in the bumper or something like that. So this thing on the left side, right? Um, and in the middle, people talk about vision technologies, right? Like image processing, video technologies. And then it somehow discriminates objects in front of you from open space. The problem with all of these technologies is that they're all line of sight. What happens after that first car? Can you see it behind it? Uh, what about two cars? What about buildings at intersections? What happens if your field of vision is impaired or these sensors fields of visions are impaired? you lose situational awareness, right? So like the, the premise, okay, for the connected vehicle technology is that we're gonna reach a plateau in terms of situational awareness where these self-driving cars are gonna operate. And so there's gonna be not comprehensive situational awareness. They're like the self-driving cars are gonna be making decisions based on whatever information they have and it might not just be enough, right? So, that's where wireless connectivity comes in. Because the fact of the matter is, is that wireless, depending on what frequencies, of course, is not dependent on line of sight if the frequency is low enough. So, oh, there's a building? Well, this frequency, the wireless signal, can just go through the building or it could diffract around the building, but it's not a problem. I don't need line of sight for that in order for my signal to go from point A to point B or my vehicle to communicate and find out what other vehicles are doing around me. So wireless connectivity is the game changer for the uh, self-driving car market, especially for a self-driving car market. And only now are automotive manufacturers or manufacturers of self-driving car platforms beginning to see that. Okay, So this is a good time to be in the connected vehicle world and collaborate with folks in the autonomous vehicle world. So this is exactly a case that uh, I'm trying to advocate. Uh, let's say this uh, tiled uh, roof building over here, uh, and the red car doesn't necessarily see this car at the corner until it's too late. Let's say if this car is going 50 kilometers per hour, that car is going into that intersection. Bad things happen. Like bad things as in uh, that car, it will be too late. For, uh, like, you know, the physics of the vehicle, depending on its weight, depending on the conditions of the road, might not be able to brake in time in order to avoid a collision with that other vehicle. Now, the issue, the big issue here is the availability of gaining access to wireless spectrum. You might say, oh, okay, no problem. I'm just going to use either 2.4 gigahertz right, to 2.5 gigahertz, the ISM band, the Industry Scientific and Medical Band, right, it's an unlicensed band. Or I could use uh, five point, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the five, five points, uh, you know, the five gigahertz band, which is also unlicensed in the United States. Okay, so caveat, I'm, a lot of these frequency bands I'm mentioning are, um, have very specific um, uh, regulation, regulatory um, specifications in the United States. It might be different in other countries. But in the United States, 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz is unlicensed. Uh, five, uh, the 5 gigahertz band, which goes up all the way to uh, 5.8, 5.9 gigahertz, that is also unlicensed. And then there's 75 megahertz of spectrum right after that that is licensed and is the only licensed frequency band for vehicle communications. Right, so 75 megahertz of spectrum in the United States is all that is there that would allow for vehicle communications to occur. And then everything else is unlicensed spectrum, so it's dog eat dog. So you're gonna have to compete with 5G communications, you're gonna have to compete with Wi-Fi 6, you're gonna have to compete with every other wireless communication system out there that's using that unlicensed spectrum. Uh, so a couple of developments 
very interesting developments. The six gigahertz band, which goes up all the way to 7.125 gigahertz, right? Da, 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 da. As of a couple of months ago, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission of the United States, just made that unlicensed access. So, hey, great. That's potentially more unlicensed access for vehicle communications. Bad news. That's 75 megahertz of spectrum. The FCC just issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that they're going to cut that in half. So if you think 75 megahertz of wireless spectrum is not a lot to support vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, half of that's even worse. So we have to come up with a way to be able to support vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications if we want self-driving car technology to really have that comprehensive situational awareness. Okay. So first of all, like, you know, this is kind of a shoddy attempt <laughs> of showing like, you know, the potential of how vehicles can really uh, connect with each other. This is like at a more macroscopic level. This is actually a kind of a pixelated version of what the WPI campus is in Worcester, Massachusetts. So WPI is here in Worcester. This is the northern part of the city of Worcester. And if you want all the vehicles to connect with each other at a macroscopic, not time sensitive level, you can have something called like vehicular internet of things, right? That's great. Uh, but let's say you want something that, that supports time sensitive operations. Well, then you're going to need bandwidth. You're going to need rel reliable access to that bandwidth. And you're going to need, you're going to need a lot of it, especially if you have a lot of cars. Okay. And what, what sort of operations would you ha would you need wireless connectivity self-driving cars, even human-operated vehicles to, uh, to, in order to support, um, um, uh, you know, like, uh, like, you know, safe, reliable um, uh, vehicle operations. How about the simple lane change? You might say, okay, lane changing, big deal. Doesn't sound dramatic. It doesn't sound like something from an action film you see from Hollywood. No, lane changing is actually really dangerous. I'm not sure how many of you drive a car. But imagine you're on a highway, right, or a motorway. You're going 90 kilometers per hour, 100 kilometers per hour, and you want to go into the faster lane, right? Uh, here, the illustration that I have, uh, the cars are traveling from left to right, um, and the passing lane is the top lane. So this is the American, uh, the American version of, of a motorway. Like, of course, uh, New Zealand and a lot of other countries, it's the opposite. Uh, but here, like this use, assumes an American model. Um, it's quite frightening. If you're trying to do a lane change, you're traveling at 80 kilometers per hour in sort of the regular travel lane, and then traffic is passing you at 100 kilometers per hour, and you want, to you want to pass car two, and you're car one, but car three is approaching really quickly, and car four is right in front of you in the passing lane. So there's, like, and imagine car one's autonomous, car one's self-driving. It's going to require a lot of information. How can this be done safely, okay, just based off of LIDAR and uh, radar and all these other things? Well, you know, maybe, maybe it's possible, but uh, this is a prime example where you could use connectivity um, in order to support, um, you know, an operation that seems benign, but it's actually quite complicated, the lane change. Even car following, which I'll talk about in the use case, especially multiple cars following, is quite complex. It's quite complex, especially when no humans are involved, right? So that's why that, as well as the other model, the V to I, the vehicle to infrastructure model, um, is, is quite important in terms of connecting all these vehicles. This is actually what I'm gonna be talking about at the end of this presentation, which is called platooning. So platooning is when you have one, two, three, four, five, it could be N cars, they're all traveling in a lane together uh, in unison, and they're all coordinating their actions together, right? So they're going to need connectivity with each other in order to exchange what they're going to be doing, as well as potentially with the surrounding environment, right? So this begs the question, like, is there enough wireless spectrum? And my answer would be, is another question, uh, what is enough? Well, 
this is what a typical, well, I would not say it's a typical American highway. Uh, this is actually a, <laughs> a really bad, like really bad case, but I've, I've been at highways around the, the Boston area, right? This is where Worcester, Worcester is located close to Boston. Um, but there are a lot of highways out there that look very eerily similar to this. And imagine in just a, a short stretch of road, you're gonna to have to have connectivity and enough wireless spectrum to exchange information and situational uh, awareness to be gathered by all vehicles, all other vehicles around their environments in a mess like this. Is there enough wireless spectrum? So what I'm gonna be talking about is this idea of, first of all, finding out do we have enough wireless spectrum? What's the behavior of that wireless spectrum? And then how do we take advantage of let's, what we call spectral white spaces, empty portions of spectrum, in order to fill those, uh, those empty portions with communications that we could use to support traffic scenarios such as this, such that every vehicle, human operated and self-driving, okay, with enough situational awareness information to avoid uh, potentially any collisions, and make the road safe, okay? So, so a scenario like that, I already motivated the fact that in terms of dedicated wireless spectrum, we're already a little bit in trouble here in the United States because 75 megahertz now divided by two is all we got across this entire country dedicated to vehicle communications. So we got to come up with ways of trying to access wireless spectrum in more opportunistic approaches in order to facilitate communications when we have hundreds of cars across one kilometer of road. So the idea, the vehicular dynamic spectrum access concept is as follows. Suppose we go into spectrum where we are not the licensed user, we're not the licensed application. Suppose we go into unlicensed wireless spectrum, like five to 5.8 something something, or 5.9 to 7.1 gigahertz. We're not the license application in either of those bands. So we're gonna to have to fight with all the other uh, wireless applications operating there. So what vehicular dynamic spectrum access does, it's an opportunistic approach where suppose, in this case, we have the assumption of primary transmissions, but in an unlicensed band, there's no such thing as primary, right? Um, if let's say on the other hand, folks have looked at looking at digital television wireless spectrum as ways of, of, of like, because television spectrum is not fully utilized in the United States. So the white space, the empty spectrum there potentially could be used opportunistically to be used by vehicle communications in order to support vehicle to vehicle comms like between A and B or A and D or D and C. So as long as we don't interfere with the primary transmissions, so if it's digital television, that would be the gray blocks here on top, and the red and blue and green would be our vehicle communications that would fit in between and not interfere with any of those primary transmissions. In unlicensed spectrum, right, like the five gigahertz band and the six gigahertz band, um, these would instead be, instead of primary transmissions, maybe other unlicensed transmissions that got there first. And our communications would wrap around those and not interfere with them. We would coexist with them, but still support vehicle connectivity. And with that vehicle connectivity and that information exchange, we can then do onboard decision-making, such as how do we change lanes? How do we follow, how do we uh, follow that vehicle? How do we do platooning and all those other very complicated maneuvers, right? So what we would do is we need a way of doing vehicular dynamic spectrum access such that A and B can talk with each other. Maybe in this red part of the spectrum here, in this red part of the spectrum here, this X axis here is the frequency. Uh, and A and D can communicate in this blue band and D and C can communicate in that green band, right? So what we did, the first step is understanding what the spectrum landscape looks like. So what I did in 2009 with Toyota is, okay, the, let's look at, before we had all this massive amount of unlicensed spectrum, 
uh, we had digital television in the United States, which was beautiful spectrum from 460 megahertz all the way to nearly 800 megahertz. We had a few television channels and the rest was empty television white space, was just spectral white space everywhere. And what, what do you know about television? Well, television never goes off the air. It's six megahertz wide, it's always on, and it's very predictable. So it's like, oh my God, this is such beautiful spectrum. But uh, here's the problem, cars move. And wireless spectrum doesn't look the same from one point on a highway compared to another. So what we did is we did an empirical measurement study in 2009 where we took, we physically took wireless spectrum measurements of television across all 139 miles, that's um, a little over 200 kilometers of highway in Massachusetts, every 10 kilometers or no, no, five kilometers or so uh, to, to, to kind of see, okay, what does the wireless spectrum at the television band look like at this point, at this point, at this point, at this point. So like for instance, this diagram here in Boston, okay, um, like suppose this is a six megahertz television band, this is a six megahertz television band, this is six megahertz television band, and in each one of these is a six megahertz television band. Oh, digital television is beautiful because you could right away tell it's television because it's rectangular in shape, it has a pilot tone to one side, it's ap it sticks out, it's absolutely beautiful. And some are occupied, that's the gray boxes here, and some channels, six megahertz channels are free that's where we would do the opportunistic spectrum access, the VDSA. But notice how in Boston, we have some empty bands and others are not. In Auburn, Massachusetts, which is about a third of a way across the state of Massachusetts, we have a different allocation of available versus unavailable. Springfield, Massachusetts is midway across the state. Lee, Massachusetts is nearly at the other end, the western end of the state, and we have even more spectrum available. So understanding your spectrum, especially as a function of distance, is very important. So that's exactly what we did here. Here's a map of Massachusetts. So Boston is here, New York State is here at the, at the left, and each one of these blue pins represents where we did a measurement uh, to see what is the availability of wireless spectrum. And this heat map here, okay, tells us, okay, um, so it's Interstate 90, that's the major highway that goes east-west across Massachusetts. So what this heat map tells us, okay, is the availability of wireless spectrum in Massachusetts, uh, where we can and where we cannot uh, transmit uh, in, 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 um, in, um, across Massachusetts. So the x-axis is uh, frequency, so uh, 470 megahertz all the way to 800 megahertz. So that's the digital frequency band in the United States. Again, this might be different in depending on which country you're located in. The y-axis is distance. Boston, Newton, Framingham, Westboro, Auburn, Sturbridge, Palmer, Chicopee, Blanchford, West Beckett, Lee, West Stockbridge. So those are towns and cities all along going from east, which is Boston, all the way to west, West Stockbridge, which is on the border of New York State. And what the heat map tells us, okay, is the threshold. What's the maximum power in dB that I can transmit um, in each one of those? So you might wonder why, 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 what are these perfectly narrow rectangles? Those are precisely six megahertz wide. So each one of these narrow rectangles are six megahertz wide. And so e these are, each of these is a digital fre television frequency. And the deep blue, minus 60 dB, tells that's the, the maximum limit of transmit power that I can transmit my wireless signal in that band, okay? And not interfere with a digital television signal. And then red, bright, bright, bright red is zero dB. So the bright red is ideally where I would wanna transmit mainly because uh, that's the maximum power I can pump out and I would have the best SNR in those scenarios, depending on the distance between vehicles. And blue would be like, I'm maximally constrained because I would potentially be interfering with a television transmission. 
Okay. So what I've done is here's a few um, uh, publications from that research from Toyota. This was like a three or four year long um, research collaboration with Toyota. So we publish in a number of venues, including IEEE Communications Magazine. We publish in a few conferences, including VTC. That's the VTS's uh, flagship conference and a few other places. Okay. So, so that, that's the first part. So what I've just described, okay, I've set the context saying that spectrum as a function, wireless spectrum in a vehicle sense is not as, there is an element of time, but it's also very heavily dependent on distance along a roadway, right? Now, um, and that we have to be very careful if we're going to opportunistically take advantage of unused spectrum, that we're always aware of, of what that situation looks like down the road, because otherwise what will end up happening is that we might uh, interfere with another signal, primary or another unlicensed secondary signal, uh, but, uh, unintentionally, but still, it doesn't matter if it's intentional or unintentional. Okay. So I think there was a, a couple of questions, so I'm going to try and bring that up. Well, um, actually, what I'll do is um, I'm going to I'm going to answer uh, questions at the end because it seems um, yeah I, like uh, I, I will answer them, but I'm going to answer them at the end uh, in order to keep my train of thought going. But uh, but I, I just scanned through what the chat and they look impressive, so I'll, I'll definitely answer them. Um, bumblebee foraging. So what the heck is bumblebee foraging? How does that get involved in all of this? Okay. So funny story. Um, so one of my research interests is cognitive radio, right? So you hear the word cognitive. Now cognitive sounds like brain. Sounds like uh, some sort of intelligence, right? Um, and I don't know, a lot of folks were like saying, oh, cognitive radio, and uh, somehow the knee-jerk reaction, people instinctively say, ah, human cognition. Um, but what ended up happening was, uh, I, I had a very interesting conversation with um, my grad students one day and was like, well, why do we have to have such a complex cognition process? Why not something a little bit simpler? Why not something like uh, an insect or, or some simpler animal? So at that same time, a press release came out. This is how biologists look at bumblebee behavior, okay, and how they act. Uh, these, these things, these funny looking uh, color things, these are plastic flowers. The fl and the colors, they put different levels of nectar. And what they do is they observe bumblebees. They like release bumblebees into this, this screen room. And they look at how the bumblebees observe, act, and behave, and remember the color of flowers in order to memorize which flowers have a lot of reward, a lot of nectar, and which ones do not. Very interesting. Why not apply this to how to act with respect to gaining access to wireless spectrum? These frequency bands are very rewarding. These frequency bands are awful. They're not rewarding at all. Very poor SNR. Uh, can never really do anything with them. Constantly being interfered with. Can we use the bumblebee behavioral model as the premise for accessing wireless spectrum in a VDSA context? That would be awesome. And so we actually came up with something. So um, we have an IEEE access journal paper. So it's open access, so everyone can access it with colleagues of mine from the biology department here at WPI who, uh, whose expertise are in bumblebee behavior. And so what we did is we tried to bridge get the gap between the biology world and the electrical and computer engineering world, which is no small feat. Even the word sampling, sampling in an in a electrical and computer engineering world actually means a completely different thing in the biology world. So it took about a month for us to figure out that one. But let's, let's zero in, okay? Let's see how bumblebees behave, okay? So bumblebees, the way they behave, um, is step one, what bumblebees be do is they actually go around and they, they, um, uh, they, they um, sample all flowers and memorize color and they try and determine reward. Okay. So, uh, and, and just, just a heads up, bumblebees are very different than honeybees and ants. Because you've heard of like swarm optimization and ant colonies and 
honeybees and all that. The thing is, honeybees and ants are socially dependent animals. Bumblebees are socially independent animals. They'll take in all the information, but then they're going to act independently. They're gonna, so, they're, so, so they don't necessarily go according to whatever the hive or the colony says. They'll, they'll, the, so, so what they'll do is they'll say, oh, very interesting. Purple flowers have the most reward. I'm going to be sampling purple flowers. But once in a while, they're going to sample a yellow flower, red flower, or white flower. So they'll, they'll go to the flower. In this case, it's the white flower that has the most reward and just keep on sampling white flowers. But occasionally, they're going to like check out other flowers. And what they're also going to do is they're going to see where rewards increase and decrease. And they're going to, at some point, they'll say, oh, red flowers are now very rewarding. I'm going to go after red flowers. Okay, no longer white flowers. How does that mirror to a vehicle context with VDSA? Well, what happens is here in a vehicle context, suppose you have channels one through eight, okay, that, you, that your vehicles can access. One, two, four, and eight are constantly being used. There might be some intermissions where they're unused, but for the most part, they're not very desirable. So three, five, six, and seven are actually quite attractive to, to take advantage of. So I'm opportunistically speaking, I'm gonna take advantage of six because it's the farthest away from a used channel. So that means I'm gonna get um, the least amount of interference that's coming out of band from any used channel. So I'm gonna take advantage of that. Then over time and across the road, uh, the environment changes and some channels become more occupied, some are gonna become less occupied. And then all of a sudden, six becomes more occupied by other transmissions. Mm, not very desirable. So what's the next sort of like sampling again, the different frequencies, the different channels, what's the next uh, good one? Oh, uh, channel seven, I start transmitting there. So now the, the, the key here is, can we translate bumblebee foraging behavior over to vehicle, uh, vehicle dynamic spectrum access? And the answer is yes. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. Even if you go a step further, not just bumblebees, there is a concept, there's, there are several books written on this in the biology circles called foraging behavior. Wolves do it, uh, moose do it, uh, bumblebees do it, sharks do it. There's, there, there, there's very specific behavior that animals follow in order to survive. So why not, the premise is, why don't we build that type of functionality into our radios? Okay, so what we want is basically a radio that it can sense, it can see what the wireless channels are around it, and then find the best suited channel, the one that produces the best possible results for communications in order for it to communicate information with another vehicle. Now, in addition to that, in addition to that, um, there is one thing that's really, really super duper important, which will come up later in some of the results, which is I want to minimize the amount of times that I have to switch channels. Because when I switch channels, it, I take a hit in performance. I've got to sort of resync my channels. Um, I, 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 there's a lot of overhead. Um, it, it, just, it just becomes kind of an unpleasant situation where I have to sort of pick up my tent, go to another frequency channel, and then reestablish communications with another radio. Uh, and, I, and I lose cycles, and there might be latency that's introduced. And in that time, maybe there's a potential car accident that's waiting to happen. So some key definitions between bumblebee nomenclature and vehicle nomenclature. So the channel uh, in the vehicle world, the vehicle communications world is like the floral species. Channel sensing is bumblebee foraging. Radio discovery of new channels is bumblebees discovering flowers of a specific type. And the comparisons go on and on. So coming up with a common lingua franca between biologists and electrical and computer engineering wireless people uh, was very important with respect to this interdisciplinary research. So the algorithm uh, shown here, and this was actually published in VTC in uh, 2018, the spring edition. Um, the way it works is you initialize the model and the bumblebee discovers the flower type of a specific type. So let's say it's an unoccupied channel. Okay. So, and what it does is several things. So first of all, has that flower type been visited before? Is it a white flower? Is it a red flower? If no, what you do is you say, okay, I need to evaluate how much nectar it has. Is it, like, is it a really rewarding flower or is it not? 
Okay. If I have, then I need to update my memory with respect to the amount of nectar that that type of flower has. Now, uh, does the nectar amount exceed the harvesting threshold? So there, so this is, the, this means like, essentially, is it worth my while for me to gather that nectar or is it too, is, is the amount of energy expended to gather that ne nectar not worth it? Uh, if it's not w above that threshold, I go to another flower type. If it is, then I harvest the nectar and then I exit the algorithm, right? So it's very simple, right? And, and even you could probably model it to human beings as well, right? Is it really worth going to that restaurant across town or is the restaurant down the street good enough for dinner, right? <laughs> so this is what I meant by switching costs. So switching costs is the amount of energy, right? The, the, the penalty that I take for switching from one channel to another. So I really do want to stick to one flower, to one channel as long as possible. I do not want to restart communications in a completely different frequency band. It's just not worth it. It takes energy, right? And what this figure here is as well from the VTC conference from 2018 um, was, was a kind of a nice histogram from the Gem V2 um, uh, traffic simulation that we did. Um, that kind of showed um, the switching costs when we had both highway conditions for vehicle to uh, vehicle communications and vehicle to vehicle communications in an urban environment like New York City or any major big city. And what we notice is that in a highway condition, switching costs were were okay, right? Uh, but in a in a high, uh, urban scenario, it actually was pretty bad. And part of it is just the nature of the environment, and like cars are in close quarters. Uh, it's highly variable, it's highly time, like, you know, it's very time varying. There are a lot of vehicles, there's a lot of things going on. Cars come in to the network topology, cars leave the network topology, it's a mess, right? And so being able to find a, a stable frequency band in order to communicate across and then having to lose it and find a new band and then the latency associated with trying to establish a new link or an existing link, uh, but in a new frequency band, is, uh, is, is quite bad, right? So, and then what we also looked at is when we looked at packet, error, uh, packet rates, when we send lots of messages, and the probability, this is actually really important, the probability that all channels are busy, right? So, uh, and again, what we looked at here, okay, we modeled this again using the GEMV computer simulation for like traffic modeling and such. Um, as we increase the packet rate for each vehicle, like so every vehicle that we were modeling in this traffic simulation, uh, obviously what happens is you begin to fill up all available spectrum bands and you begin getting all channel busy scenarios here, especially um, as we progress in this, in this specific, this is a very, very specific um, uh, um, trace, if you will, of a computer simulation with both 10 messages and 20 messages per second uh, for that computer simulation. So this is really bad because if all channels are busy, uh, we're in trouble because what ends up happening is suppose I don't have, again, enough dedicated wireless spectrum to do emergency communications and I, I'm dependent on this sort of secondary access, this VDSA, and I have no way to communicate across frequency to communicate to the vehicle surrounding me saying, hey, there's a car accident or a very dangerous situation up, up, to he up ahead, this is not good news. Then those cars around me don't have complete situational awareness, right? So, um, over the past couple, uh, couple of months, what we've been doing is we've, we've done some experimentation with uh, IEEE 802.11p. Uh, so that's one way, it's a, a file layer representation of doing vehicle to vehicle networking, right? And uh, it's an IEEE standard, um, which is based off of the IEEE 802.11 uh, Wi-Fi standard. So it's almost like Wi-Fi, but there's a few tweaks to it in order to support it doing vehicle to vehicle communications. Um, another, uh, wireless standard that has come out uh, is the CV2X or cellular vehicle to everything uh, standard, um, which is from uh, fi uh, 5G, right? So the three GPP standards folks. And um, what we've done, okay, is we implemented both of these um, using software-defined radio. Again, we do a lot of prototyping in my research lab. So that team you saw at the beginning 
a lot of those folks in that photograph uh, know how to not only do the theoretical wireless analysis and propose new solutions, but we also know how to build it in software-defined radio. And what we in particular did is we kept everything else the same in terms of the protocol stack. So we use something called open air interface. So it's an open, it's an open source project that implements 4G and 5G, as well as um, you know, the enhanced packet core and all this other nice, good networking stuff. Uh, but we tweaked the physical layer in order to implement the Bumblebee-based uh, vehicular dynamic spectrum access algorithm that we saw before. And we also had a, a, a PC5 sidelink channel that connected the, trans the vehicle one, vehicle two, to each other in the v, uh, CV2X model. And so this is the actual representation of that. So we had two X310 USERPs, uh, right? So these are software-defined radios that are used a lot in the community. Uh, we had an octoclock. This allowed us to synchronize both USERPs. So we actually didn't put this into actual cars. Um, uh, let's just say that, uh, that that's a little bit more expensive. It's doable, and that's probably going to be the next step, especially once quarantining is over here in the United States. So, but in a lo controlled laboratory context, especially also with respect to frequencies, because we'd, we don't have license, this was using license frequencies, so we could not do this broadcasting over the air. But what we did is we had, um, so th this guy here, the GD, um, uh, the GPS DO, this is the disciplined oscillator that's uh, GPS related. So we had an antenna going to the roof. So we were getting uh, the GPS uh, clock. It's connected to the octo clock. That allowed for um, synchronization of these two radios. And these two radios modeled the vehicle to vehicle communications using the CV2X standard, which was implemented using the uh, OAI open source package. Okay. And what we did is in this case, we were studying, among other things, so instead of computer simulation, this is actual hardware implementation results. Uh, we were looking at the impact of memory size. So what do you mean by memory? Well, I want to see how the spectrum look like, looks like and the experiences I had with the wireless spectrum um, over not just like the past last experience, but like over the last several experiences, maybe a couple of minutes and see how the, uh, the spectrum behaves, such that that would feed into my bumblebee forging behavioral modeling of wireless spectrum access actions to know, oh, that spectrum's always busy, stay away from that. Oh, that spectrum's always available, use that. Um, and we got the, these performance gains. And, but there's, of course, a trade-off, right, in terms of like the amount of available uh, channel bandwidth. So the CV2X standard al allows for both 5 megahertz channels and 10 megahertz channels between vehicles. So we looked at both of those and the latency it took uh, with respect to um, uh, being able to, um, like, you know, given these different memory sizes in order to uh, access these wireless channels uh, based on, um, you know, past memories of how the channel behaved uh, spectrally in terms of its occupancy. Okay. And so these are some of the publications. So the, the one that the results we just saw was actually just published in uh, VTC May 2020. Uh, this was a virtual conference. But nevertheless, uh, the paper should be available, if not already in IEEE Explorer, but very soon. And there are quite a few other papers. The one that if anybody's really interested to kind of like dig in and say, what the heck is a Bumblebee behavioral model? Check out the one in IEEE Access. I mentioned this before. IEEE Access, if you, if let's say in the least amount of search terms, look for IEEE Access Memory Matters, Bumblebee. If you put in just that into Google, boom, you should be able to get this, okay? Uh, this is kind of like the first paper on, that describes everything that I just was talking about with respect to Bumblebee behavioral models and the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, all right? Now, it's one thing to access wireless spectrum, but there are other techniques, signal processing techniques that you could use, and I mentioned this before, there's beamforming. So beamforming is the technique of using, um, in this case, we are using an electronically phased array in order to combine different wireless signals emitting from different antennas in order to uh, constructively and destructively combine to project energy in, uh, signal energy in some directions and not in others. Um, so I'm just going to jump ahead in the interest of time. 
But what we were doing here is this idea of we have a transmit vehicle, we have a receive vehicle, and what beamforming does is the gray represents the electromagnetic energy coming out of a phased array, uh, which is represented by these triangles on top of the vehicles. So energy would be projected, signal energy would be projected primarily to the receive vehicle and minimized elsewhere around the vehicle. And then the receive vehicle will be maximally sensitive to energy coming from the transmit vehicle and not as sensitive to signals coming from around it in other directions. So what we're effectively doing is we're doing spatial filtering. So some math, right? So this is like, you know, you can go to any sort of phase array textbook, but uh, what you do is if you have a bunch of isotropic sources, so let's say dipole antennas, the array factor okay, um, tells you, given the number of antenna elements, tells you what like your beam pattern is going to look like, right? So it's going to be maximally sensitive or, or maximally project electromagnetic energy in one direction while not in others, right? And then you can calculate how much power is going to be received based on that pattern. And then, and then using that, Okay, we can we can then start like, you know, if we have if we like, you know, so that's physics. So there's no probability associated with that. But okay, so here's the big, big caveat. There are going to be two issues with respect to beam forming. One, you're only as good as knowing where your intended receiver is. So if your if your receiving vehicle says I'm here, but there's GPS error involved, well it's gonna be a problem because you're gonna be projecting like this guy here in the figure 16 towards where the vehicle says it is, but the vehicle is actually located here where the black triangle is. So that's a problem, right? So GPS error, which is a random phenomenon, is actually well studied. So what we did is we actually looked at positioning error calculations, right? So we looked at things like dilution of precision, uh, based for GPS position measurements, and then also user equivalent range error so Adop and URI. And what we did is we were able to come up with uh, statistical models that we were able to factor into the performance calculations of when we do beamforming between two vehicles where they're both beamforming to each other. And what we did is we both evaluated the signal to noise ratio when we increased and decreased the distance between transmitting and receive vehicles. And we get this nice pattern um, as we increase the number of antenna elements on each of the vehicles, right? And, okay, so what happens when you increase the number of isotropic um, um, uh, antenna elements in a, in, a, in a phase array? Well, what happens is your beam pattern becomes much more crisp. It becomes much more precise. Becomes the beam, the, the bore side becomes, uh, the beam pattern becomes more narrow. So, uh, it's less likely it's going to spread ener spew energy all over the place. Now, what happens is um, the energy gets projected in a specific way and nowhere else, which is great. Um, so what we have here, right, is um, what, what, we're, we're, what we're looking at is the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and when we're, this is, uh, uh, I forgot, this is in meters. Yeah, yeah, it's in meters. So minus 500 meters is when um, the transmitting vehicle is 500 meters behind the receive vehicle, and 500 meters here is when the transmit vehicle is 500 meters ahead of the receive vehicle. Phased arrays, what they do with the beam patterns is that they can electronically steer it, which means I can, I can just continuously have these two guys point at each other continuously. The maximum signal to noise ratio is when there's zero distance of separation between the two and we get like really nice, awesome signal to noise ratio in dB. This translates into when we have bit error rate, okay? As we increase the antenna elements, um, what ends up happening is as of course, when you get farther and farther away, your bit error rate becomes worse and worse, uh, but you still get better performance when you have more antenna elements uh, because of how, like, how it minimizes, let's say, um, it, it projects energy much more in one direction than any other direction, and it, it, it minimizes also the very important second issue, which is interference, and especially interference from other vehicles who might also be beam forming and driving by you. 
right? So we looked at that, and this actually got published in VTC 2020 spring, also in Antwerp, but it's a virtual conference, so it should come out soon. So in addition to GPS error, we looked at interference from other vehicles, which is very possible, especially those that don't even connect with your network for more than a fraction of a second. So what we looked at, again, is the impact of moving vehicles and the interference on a pair that are communicating with each other, and that pair is 250 meters apart. And what we see here, you might say, okay, what's that hump? Why is, why is bit error rate getting really bad? It's because the vehicle that's interfering is now in between the two vehicles. As the interfering vehicle is very far away, either zero meters away, or like, you know, like, 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 when, what, sorry, when, when the, when the when interfering vehicle is far away from the two other vehicles that are 250 meters apart, um, its interference is, does not have too much of an impact, right? 10 to the minus four. Well, it's kind of an impact, but it's not as bad as if there, it's right there, just continuously transmitting at accidentally the receiver, right? So, so that paper with the interference, this is the one. Navita Kanthasamy is a PhD student that's working on it. And I'm collaborating with a professor from aerospace engineering, uh, Raigu Kalagi, who uh, does a lot of control theory. So we did a lot of control theory in terms of the tracking the beam pattern uh, with respect to the vehicles and stuff in, uh, in order to have that lock. And he's also an expert in GPS. So he was able to help a lot. And then the positioning errors was Navita's first paper, and that was from 2018. So last but not least is the use case. So we hear in the United States, there's a lot of talk about like, you know, what's the killer app? What's the first app about self-driving cars on the road? The big one, the really big one. Okay, so obviously, you know, if you want to buy a, a really expensive luxury car and self-driving, you can have at it. You can buy that. Uh, but the first commercial application will probably be autonomous trucking. And there's a lot to be said about trucks operating in platoons, because when they're operating in platoons, what they do is if you operate in platoons, the first truck is going to experience a lot of aerodynamic kind of like uh, resistance because it's a, here's this like 12 to 15 foot tall truck that's trying to move all this air. But if the other trucks are close behind it, it falls into a slipstream and it meets very little air resistance and therefore is fuel efficient. So you get a situation that kind of looks like this. So you have platoon one, car, 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 or truck, 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 and then platoon two, truck, 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 truck. So how do they coordinate with each other? They, well, they will connect. And the big worry, and this was a paper that we published also in VTC 2020 spring in Antwerp, is what happens if you have um, collaborative adaptive cruise control or CACC and connectivity and you're using digital television spectrum and oh, by the way, you have groups of digital television transmit, um, sorry, the digital terrestrial televisions that are also nearby that could potentially be interfered with. What do you do? Well, you use Bumblebee foraging. So this is actually a collaborative project with some really good friends of mine at Poznan University of Technology in Poznan, Poland. And what we did is we looked at the spectral white space behavior. Okay, so these are actual measurements and then approximations of spectral channels, okay, at 490 megahertz and at uh, 522 megahertz. And what happens is this purple line here says that's the threshold for, for receptions. Like, you know, below it, it's like too weak for a, a, a DTT to pick up the signal, but above it, it can very clearly pick it up. Can we use Bumblebee, the Bumblebee algorithm for opportunistically accessing wireless spectrum here? So when, let's say for instance, this green line goes below the purple line, can we take advantage of that wireless spectrum at uh, at uh, 500, 522 megahertz, even for a moment, to communicate some vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. And then here, the black signal, uh, the black measurement here, like uh, the 490 megahertz, it's almost all the time below the purple threshold, except for here and here. That's a very nice spectrum because I could use those moments to communicate information, okay, on this stretch of road uh, and not interfere with anybody listening to that TV channel. So what we did is we did, uh, we looked at successful packet uh, reception rate. 
And uh, we looked at like, you know, the control channel, the control channel with TV white space with no switching, T uh, control channel TV white space um, with Bumblebee and uh, zero costs associated with the switch. And, and then we looked at different costs and stuff. And um, what we got were these trends. And what we were looking at was a platoon where we had one, the car in position, one, two, three, four, five. So we had nine cars in a row. And uh, they were basically relaying to each other, V to V to V to V to V, exchanging information um, and trying to also avoid switching um, uh, as much as possible in, in that environment, which, which I sh showed be here. So across five kilometers of roadway, the 490 megahertz channel was quite attractive, while the green channel, for the most part, was very, very busy and we could not really interfere with. And so we, we were looking at trends. And what happened is, um, when we were looking at this, the probability of successful reception um, compared to just having a control channel versus control channel with, in addition to that, TV white space using the Bumblebee okay, VDSA algorithm with a 6 dB cost, um, you know, perform the best in all the scenarios where just having a control channel saying, you can use this channel, you can use that channel, um, so like no insight on memory, um, no sort of like, you know, sort of feeling out and trying to kind of assign rewards on the different channels uh, that I could use and such. Um, uh, we found that the, the Bumblebee algorithm with that 6 dB cost uh, yielded best results. So, okay, so enough of me and yabbering. So this, this paper just again got published and it was at the VTC conference in May, 2020. So Pavel Shroka and Krushevitz and Sibus and Klicks, um, my PhD student Kuldeep Gill and myself published this. So with that, um, I just wanna thank all of you again for your, um, your time and attention. Uh, what I'm gonna do, this is my contact, my, my email address, it's alexw at wpi.edu. And what I'll do is um, I'm gonna do a combination of answering, first I'm gonna try and answer the questions in the, um, shucks, in the chat, because, um, and again, thanks to everyone for your patience with that. Uh, it, I just, uh, it's very difficult for me to multitask, so I, I just wanted to present and then I'm gonna address. And then I'll also take uh, questions from, from the floor. I'll also stop recording this so folks can ask questions more freely as well. So with that, again, thank you for your time. And what I'll do is uh, I will stop recording. So thank you again.